session of the technical stage, the last session for the whole conference. Uh, my name is Stefan Beira. I'm um, ICS security team manager with GIE Net Consult in Berlin, Germany, which you might hear from my accent. Um, we have one speaker in the last session. It's Alvaro Cardenas. He is an assistant professor at the computer science department and Yes, the University of Texas in Dallas, and he will be presenting on economic analysis of ICS attack consequences. Please welcome Alvaro. All right, thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is Alvaro Cárdenas. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. And what I'm going to be presenting today is a uh, joint work with some of my colleagues. So Carlos Barreto, who is my uh, PhD student, and <coughs> Jennifer Holmes, who is a professor in political science, uh, Agustin Palau, who is her PhD student, and then Juan Carlos Restrepo, who is the uh, chief security uh, officer of, um, of, a, of the main Colombian independent system operator, or the, chief of the, or the ISO of Colombia. And uh, this is a project funded by NSF, uh, and we're dealing with uh, some of the issues that, or, that we have, or the lessons that we have learned from years of experience of physical attacks in, uh, in Colombian infrastructure. So let me see. So yeah. <clears throat> so to give you a little bit of a background on, on why, like why are we looking at Colombia. So uh, Colombia has, also, has suffered uh, decades of civil war now. Uh, there are basically two main uh, guerrilla groups. There, there are a couple of more, but th these are the two bi biggest ones. Uh, so the FARC, who is the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, and the ELN, or the National Liberation Army. So these are the two main guerrilla groups that have been fighting the government, and also they're mostly yeah, left-wing groups. They fight the government, and they also fight uh, like right-wing illegal groups. And they started basically as revolutionary movements around 60s, in the, in the 60s, and they originated, yeah, because there, there was a lot of political violence um, in, in Colombia, uh, social dissatisfaction, you know, the, uh, the difference between, um, like, the elite and the public, and then communist influence. So, uh, there was, a, I guess, at the time, the Cuban Revolution and then the Soviet Union was, uh, like, really interested in um, expanding the communism in, in Latin America, so they, they were trying to fund or motivate groups to, grow, to appear and, and like take over the government. And, uh, and, why, and these, are, these groups have been attacking basically uh, the Colombian infrastructure for uh, at least three decades. So uh, data compiled by the National Memorial Institute for Prevention of Terrorism uh, like had a summary and they said that among all terrorist attacks to the electricity infrastructure between 1994 and 2004, 67% of them happened in Colombia. And the rest of the country, like each country, accounted for less than 7% each. And yeah, there was a recent report also that basically counted, and it was still like we were actually growing <laughs> in the 80s or something in the last, uh, up to 2011. So, um, so that was, uh, so yeah, basically, uh, Colombia has the most attacks in the world in, against their power system. So basically, they destroy uh, Electricity transmission towers, distribution towers, substations, and there was a couple of times that they also tried to uh, destroy a, um, uh, a generator. And the largest operational experience they have, uh, so you can imagine that the people working and operating in these uh, systems have the largest operational experience with dealing and responding to physical attacks to critical infrastructures. So this is an example of uh, attacks to transportation, so there's a bridge, like for example, they destroy the bridge, and then they have sort of like criminal books that teach you what is sort of like the optimal way to destroy a bridge so that, that it delays people trying to repair it. Uh, these are attacks against the oil infrastructure, so they, they uh, and depending on the group, if you remember, uh, there were two groups, the FARC and the ELN, like they, they have a little bit of a different ideologies, uh, like the ELN, thinks a lot or, or cares a lot about um, securing the sort of like the natural resources of Colombia from foreign influence. So they say, well, these uh, like companies like BP or Occidental Petroleum, they come here and then they take all our oil, so we're going to shut them down. And that's what they do. The FARC is more against the government, so they, they try to destroy the power grid. 
So these are the examples of uh, like attacks that have happened against the power grid. So they put uh, basically uh, they dynamite the, the transmission towers and they bring them down. And, and yeah, throughout history, there has been hundreds of attacks, thousands of att attacks actually. I think that one of the largest years, um, it was an attack almost one per day <laughs> to these transmission towers uh, on average. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and yeah, so, so this experience has led, led at, to a lot of lessons learned what, what happened when you operate a system under constant attacks. So statistical information, we, we can have a statistical information of how, what happens to an attack, for example, an attacks on the power grid that leaves a city without water, attacks to a bridge that leaves a city without food supplies, like, and therefore the prices of the food increase, attacks to the power grid, which are used as a distraction for cocaine smuggling. So a lot of the times, they don't want to destroy the power grid because they want to create black, a blackout necessarily, but because, for example, they want to distract the military forces because they know that when they destroy a, a, a tower, the military forces have to come to the tower and protect basically the workers that are going to come becoming and repairing that tower. And, and so the government, basically the military forces have to de be deployed to this region and then they can sort of like smuggle cocaine through the region that was cleared. <laughs> and then, uh, and then the, the topic of this talk uh, was an interesting case in the last one, the last bullet point. Uh, between 2005 and 2008, uh, they found that, that a company in charge of repairing these towers actually bribed <laughs> or, or, or had a deal with the guerrilla so that we'll give you money and uh, so that we get more business. And this is basically the story that happened. Uh, I'm going to go into more details a little bit later on. But uh, yeah, so these are just the summary of, uh, of attacks that happened um, according to the years. They have been decreasing recently. Uh, the worst years were yeah, late in the 90s and early 2000s. As you can see, they, yeah, one of the worst years in 2000, we had almost 300 basically towers, uh, towers destroyed. And these are yeah, towers that were uh, taken down by uh, attacks. So ISA, or ISA we call them, uh, it's, the, it's the ISO, basically the main power system operator in, in Colombia, basically trans the transmission operator. So they, they deal with the transmission system. Uh, and this is, oops. And, uh, and the, <coughs> the other ones are attacks against the other power companies. So the, the main one, the, ma the main source of attacks are uh, ISA because, um, yeah, they, they have these transmission towers are in the, basically in the middle of nowhere and they're really hard to protect and they have the most sort of like return of benefit for attack. If you take down a distribution tower at the end of a line, then it doesn't have the same impact. Uh, but yeah, the, the, these are other companies are also um, dealing with that. But uh, our main um, point of contact for this talk was ISA because they were the ones who suffered from this uh, attack. So this is what happens uh, uh, when, when when attack when a tower goes down. Um, the first thing that happens is that the military has to come and secure the site because uh, the guerrilla usually leaves um, mines, landmines, so to slow down. Uh, repairs. So the military has to come, uh, make sure that there's no, like remove the land miles first, the landmines, and then make sure that there's no sniper or anything around. Once the military has come and taken control of the, of the place where the tower was destroyed, then the contractors start coming in, usually by helicopter, again, because they're in the middle of nowhere, so they have to come with, uh, yeah, with the materials and transport the contractors. Then the contractors have to destroy what remains of the tower and then they start building it again. And this is a team usually of uh, around 18 people to 25 people that come and, and basically destroy the old tower and, and start building a new one. Um, th when the attacks started, they like rebuilding a new tower took like uh, a week or two, no, two weeks actually, uh, around two weeks. And then after uh, they became so proficient, I, I forget now, I think it takes them about four days only to just do all this. <laughs> because they have so much experience in, in destroying and building towers that they're, they've become very efficient at that. Uh, and yeah, and so this is, so uh, as I was saying before, so we're, we're gonna be focusing on an example of a contractor that decided to basically, <laughs> uh, a services company that was fixing these towers that decided to pay the guerrilla to, to uh, destroy more towers. And what was happening here, uh, this slide didn't 
it's not showing the top here, but these are the years, 2005, 6, 7, and 8. And that's a map of Colombia. And, and the orange dots are the number of attacks, that, um, electric towers destroyed by the guerrilla members. And in 2005, 6, 7, and 8, you start seeing this uh, region here that starts getting many more attacks than usual. And it's basically, yeah, we did some statistical analysis, and it's a clear outlier compared to other factors. We talked to the main uh, security officer of uh, this company, and he said, yes, that's what happened. We, I, I started looking at these reports. They were like, all of a sudden, this region started getting more and more attacks. And we're trying to wonder why, because the like, guerrilla activity was not higher in that region. It was just sort of like popped. And then he started looking at the reports, like the company repairing those towers was basically the same one. And uh, he started getting suspicion, suspicious. He contacted the uh, police, uh, and they infiltrated the company. They, they posed as a, as, a, as a repair worker and then went through uh, like as an undercover agent, sorry, undercover, uh, and started analyzing what was going on. And then, yeah, they found out that uh, the contractor was actually hiring guerrilla members to destroy more towers because in the region of operation. So, so they had, these contractors usually had regions, and this particular contractor was in charge of repairing any towers that went down in this place. So they told, okay, guerrilla members, please, uh, we'll give you some money, and then you'll help us destroy more towers. And, uh, and they were, it's funny because they were asking, for example, oh, yeah, we don't want you to blow a ta a towers on the weekends <laughs> because <laughs> we don't want to pay over time. <laughs> also, we hate going like through. They have some more pictures that I wasn't clear to show for this because uh, this presentation was being recorded. But there were some more pictures that show like how hard it is to get to see these muddy terrains, and and they were saying, well, we want easier access, <laughs> and we also, um, yeah, basically nothing, uh, nothing uh, out of or oh yeah, and try not to uh, like the the. the <coughs> Like they, they told him also like the way to destroy it, so it was easier for them to continue. So uh, anyway, so so yeah, but basically that's what was happening. Uh, the contractor, the com company, the towers were down, so the company pays the contractor to repair it. But then the contractor was getting more attacks, and basically this is the attacks, uh, the number of attacks happening per state in Colombia, per per region, and this is where this spike was the region where. Uh, were, that was being uh, bribed. <laughs> and uh, well, going to the title of the talk uh, well, about economics, well, the problem, of course, is that it, there was a, a financial incentive for the services company to basically spend money on the guerrilla so that they would get more, more business. Uh, so the repair contracts are assigned using a, an auction, basically. So you have uh, basically the, the price. Uh, this is the profit that they, each contractor makes, and this is the bid that they are going to say, well, we're, we, we are going, the, the electric company says, well, we need a new services company for this region, and then multiple companies bid, and they say, well, we can repair it and th with these uh, costs, and then the contractor basically, they, they, using economics, obviously, they're going to go for the one that is the cheapest one, and they go for the cheapest one, and uh, uh, <coughs> so that's how contractors work. The data from reports on average, one attack per week, uh, approximate payment to the guerrilla was about $4,000 that they paid per tower. And the repair contract was around these two. Uh, it was, um, so this is, uh, yeah, I forgot if these were numbers based. I think this was, these were numbers taken with the dollar exchange rate at the time, because uh, in Colombia, the, <laughs> the range between the dollar US ratio changes a lot of the time. So this might not be exact dollars, but at the time, that was the price in dollars. And uh, so, um, so yeah, basically, we analyzed this story in detail. Uh, we have a paper in a, in a workshop called WISE, the Workshop on Economics and Security. And we have another under submission that has a lot more details. I'm not going to bore you with the details, just give you the high level intuition of what was happening. So intuitively, you have sort of like this theta is the number, of, like the number of towers that are attacked normally without this extra incentive. Then these are the number of attacks that are basically higher. The guerrilla hires are higher to, to destroy them. And then uh, this, is, and this, is how much, this, is, this is basically how much the company wins, the services company. So the services company gets a profit every time they repair a tower. And then they get an extra profit based on the extra ones 
And it, it can change a little bit depending on like how much lower can I send my bid, but uh, minus how, what I pay for the, for the deal with the gorillas. So I mean, I have to pay something for, for the gorillas, so this is what it goes in there, and ideally, well, I, for the services company at least, this is higher than this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we model this, this ideally the, pi the price you pay to bring that tower down, it increases, it has a fixed cost, and then it increases by the number of towers that you want to bring down, because it, uh, hiring gorillas is a scarce resource. <laughs> you don't have an, il an, an illimited number of gorillas that you can find and hire. Um, so, so you have to, it, it increases, like if, if you want one, it's cheaper than if you want 100 destroyed. So we created a model, an optimization problem, so basically the attacker wants to find uh, how many, the attacker wants to figure out how many attacks, how many extra towers should I bring down that maximizes my profits, and well, we have the, optim the optimization problem, and then we find also thinking. So economics is the is the pro is the is the problem. So the attackers has sort of like the optimal attack, the number of attacks that they, they have to bring down. But economics can also be the solution. And one one idea is, is that how can we change this optimization problem so that the incentives of the attacker are are not there, so that they don't get any benefit or their motivation for attacking more is not there. Um, so that brings us to the next part of the presentation. So, and this is actually how the electricity power company changed their contracts, how they were awarding them based on this. So they said, okay, well, what we're doing now is bad because we're incentivizing all these companies to potentially hire a guerrilla members. So this time we were lucky because these people were just greedy, right? I mean, they, it was an anomaly, a clear anomaly, and we got them. But maybe in the future, some other companies are gonna start hiring more, more, at, more uh, um, attacks, and, and we might not be able to detect them. So how can we make sure that they, are, uh, uh, they, they don't have the incentive to do this attack? So the, uh, I mean, intuitively, it, it makes sense. So, <clears throat> so instead of assigning one, only one repair company for one particular region, they said, well, we're gonna take N. So we're gonna, we're gonna have N companies servicing that region, and then we're going to choose randomly one. The problem is that the bids obviously are not going to be, uh, I'm not going to be, it's, it's, there's going to be an overhead. Before the electric company was paying this for each, ser for each uh, service contract, and now they're basically paying the maximum of this every time they, they ask a company, right? They have a, an overhead because they're not selecting the, the one that is most competitive, but they're basically saying, okay, we're going to just hire 10 of you, and then, uh, um, and then uh, yeah, basically have a fixed price for all of you, right? So whenever you go and repair, we're gonna send. Uh, so, th so there's an overhead, so they pay more, but because, uh, because the game is now, or the incentives are on average, the probability that I'm selected to repair, if I'm a malicious service company and I go to the guerrilla and ask them to bring down a tower, uh, the chances that I'm gonna be called to repair that is one over n, where n is the number of services companies repairing that area. So, so on a, and, and I still have to pay the gorilla, so it doesn't matter if they don't call me, I still have to pay them. <laughs> so so the, the profit here is, de is decreased, and I guess the, the question was, like, like, how many services companies do we need so that they don't have that incentive, so that they don't have, uh, so that the optimal theta uh, tilde, which is the extra number of I mean, the, the ones that I have to pay to bring down, it's one or close to one. So basically that was be what, what we did, and this is the economic analysis um, that we did, and yeah, basically we found uh, the number of contractors, this is the, the, number of, uh, the optimal number of attacks, and it decreases really fast when the contractors are around a dozen. Uh, when you have a, about a, like a dozen uh, um, services company, then they really don't have any incentives. In reality, now I forget how much they told me they have. I think it's around here, but we think that basically with the e reduced expected benefits and the risk of getting caught, uh, there's this probably it's like it's not worth it. It's not worth to go through the extra trouble to bring down the gorillas. And yeah, and basically, yeah, this is a, another graph that shows this is without. So this is, would be the profit, for example, of like the services company when like it, it starts decreasing, like the number of towers that they bring down. It decreases a lot because, um, again, um, they have to pay more for more towers brought down. 
But uh, if you have uh, more services companies, then they are really uh, operating at the margin. And, and if they pay for more, they pay for more attacks, they actually go into the negative, <laughs> uh, into red. So that was the, basically the intuition that the details of the contracts are a little bit more detailed. Um, so this, uh, the power company also changed the way that the, the services company hired the local population. So they said, okay, so we have services company actually, and they're not from that region. So that was another detail of the contract. We're not gonna hire if you're from that region. You have to be a services company from somewhere else and you have to bring your own personnel. So we'll pay, and that's part of the increased costs. So now we'll pay for you to bring your own personnel, but you cannot hire locally. And the reason for that was that they also didn't want the local population to, um, to be motivated to bring down towers. And uh, I was asking them if that happened, and they said, we don't know if it has happened. Uh, I was talking to another, uh, people that work in a, in a company, in a, like, like a defense company that, wants, that gives intelligence to the military officers, and they said, in the oil industry, this has happened. So, so people who are local and repair the pipelines, they have been found to like, actually be the ones putting some of the, like, the, 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 the explosives to destroy the pipelines, because then the services company comes, and they say, well, we need five more people or 10 more people to help us repair, and, and, and they hire them. Um, so, um, so yeah, basically, yeah, the, the part of the dealings is, so first, you, yeah, first you don't, it, it's a, you ha, you're gonna be selecting N companies, not just one. Second, you're not gonna be a company from the region. And third, you basically have to bring your own, uh, your own personnel. You cannot hire local people. Uh, <clears throat> so that's how uh, the contracts were changed, and this is how basically it's operating nowadays um, to making sure that this is not, not happening. Now, uh, in terms of uh, just briefly talking about the economic impacts of these attacks, uh, and we were, we've been trying to figure out, so what are the damages uh, of these systems? I mean, obviously the utility has to repair, pay for the repair services. I mean, the, the government doesn't give them any, any, um, <laughs> any money for this. And also um, there's not insurance companies. Um, I was asking them if they, they were like insurance companies saying, well, maybe they can I can, I can protect a tower and they say, no, there's no, <laughs> no insurance company that is willing to accept that risk. So basically they go, uh, they have to pay for all the repairs. Uh, but the, the, the losses are more than for the, for the electricity company. Oops. Uh, there's, the, there's also losses for uh, the government because they have sort of like military forces that have to go and deploy to secure the area. Uh, the system is also not in optimal power, fl power flow configuration and it's more expensive uh, you have to use more expensive sources of power sometimes or, or the way the system operates. So customers have to pay higher prices. There's also impacts to manufacturing, impacts to like spoiled goods. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> there's also social costs of lower power quality interruptions uh, so, and, and blackouts. So yeah, finding out the problems of this, uh, of attacks, uh, in these systems, it's, it's, uh, it's been uh, very, it's, it's, it's sort of like a science that is, hasn't been very well defined. One of the most popular ways is something called the value of lost load. But depending on the methods, we found that depending on the methods and depending on how, like how you're valuing electricity, these estimates range extremely wildly. So it's, it's really hard to figure out what is the cost, like the, so, the social cost of, of, of blackouts. And also notice that uh, a blackout is not the only way that it, uh, you can damage or, or have um, problems with the economy. You also have power quality because it can, for example, a uh, voltage sag can affect manufacturing and other sectors. So there's been a lot of real world outages and uh, it's been uh, like the, the estimates for each cost, um, for the costs are, are, are again very different depending on what happens. Uh, the, the one of the most repeated ones is the North, Car North America, Northeast blackout and Canada, the, between the US and Canada. Uh, it affected 50 million people for one or two, four days, and the cost that DOE m keeps mentioning is $6 billion, but uh, we also found several other reports saying, well, it was less, it was much more, so it's, it's, it's really difficult to figure out 
what is the precise uh, expenses of a tax, and, and that makes us that makes it really difficult to figure out what is the like what is the risk, right? Because uh, well, utilities know what is the cost, but not the social cost. So I think I am uh, already uh, this is time up. So I'm going to quickly go through the through the remaining slides. One of the biggest problems of finding also the impact of a tax is the analysis the, of long-term impacts. So people in general don't understand what is the long-term impacts because you have, uh, well, you know what is the immediate impact, but the long-term impact, for example, reduced confidence of investors and, and, like, and, and social security might be some problems. So, um, so far I have been focusing on physical attacks. Just quickly, the last two slides, so what happens in cyber. So, one of the biggest differences is that in physical attacks, it's really difficult to be an, uh, like a strategic adversary. So you basically attack more on opportunity than like, okay, like that sitting down and saying, well, this is the main power grid and I'm going to attack this, this, and this points simultaneously and that will bring down the grid. Uh, in, in cyber, you can scale through a single point of entry. So you only need one point of, point of entry and potentially uh, escape um, cause higher damages. And this is uh, related to Ukraine, I guess. Um, I missed uh, the talk on Tuesday. I was in another meeting, but uh, uh, as Marina was mentioning, I guess uh, this, is, this was not, they haven't been terribly disruptive compared to previous uh, blackouts or, or like sort of like the major ones. And there were, I, um, on Tuesday, I think they were saying, well, maybe they're using it as a training ground, not as a like, okay, I want to create massive chaos in Ukraine. So I've been working with Professor Ross Baltic uh, to try to model the same thing, the same type of attacks in, in Texas, because Texas is sort of like their own power grid, and it's actually been really difficult to figure out. So, Professor Baldic has a simulator for cascade attacks, and he's been using it for to predict the impact of damages like storms and things like that. But to take over sort of like a utility and make sure that, for example, open all the relays as what they were doing in, in Ukraine, it turns out to be a little bit tricky, and it, we're, we're still working on it. But uh, that's for future work. I'm just going to glance through this. So, I mean, cyber, cyber attacks and physical attacks are not the only problem. I mean, there's actually a, a website that keeps track of, for example, the number of attacks that <laughs> squirrels cause, or the number of blackouts that squirrels cause in the US. It's called, it's called Cyber Squirrel. And squirrels are not even the main source of, bla of small blackouts. Are tr the main source is trees. So. Uh, yeah, I was reading before this presentation that actually a monkey caused a nationwide blackout in Kenya <laughs> in 2016. So, in summary, basically what we're trying to do is, uh, the main message is uh, we want to figure out what is the risk so that we know how to better protect these systems and uh, it's still ongoing work. It's uh, really hard to figure out what are the consequences of Physical and cyber attacks, uh, we're trying to model what was going to happen in, in Texas on this. Um, so we can try to figure out, to reproduce a uh, Ukraine-style attack in Texas uh, with using a, a, a real simulator of the Texas power system. And this will help us solve uh, some of the most challenging problems, such, such as like how to figure out for cyber insurance, how much we need, uh, how dealing with catastrophic risks, because some, some things are not going to be uh, worth it for uh, insurance companies. And potentially, because it's, this is going to be sort of like a market failure, uh, what is the role of the government in, in, in market interventions? How, how to maybe subsidize some of the insurance companies uh, uh, to, to get more involved in this uh, with the help of the government? So these are some of the questions for the future. So with that, uh, yeah, I'll be open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, you're a bit over time, but we might have time for one or two short questions. Are there any questions? No question from the audience. I have one question. Um, sure. Not sure if you just um, uh, talked about this, um, but um, your model is an economic one. Yeah. And so it, it deals, in your example, with people trying to, to maximize their uh, yeah, win uh, uh, the, to try to earn as much money as, as we can. Right. If you model uh, nation state attacks, yeah. can this be modeled in a similar way or has this to be done very uh, diff uh, different? Uh, yeah, that's a really challenging question because, um, yeah, these are basically industry. They're like, what, what, what would benefit them? Uh, for nation attacks, it's, it becomes 
very political, right? And as well as social, you want to create unrest. You you might want to create your yeah your motivation might not be only like economical gains. But I mean, there's some work on that. I mean, uh, there's a, economics is not only about money, but it's also about social dynamics, basically. So there could be there are ways that we can try to model it. Uh, but we, yeah, we haven't started yet. But that's an interesting. It's a good question, yeah, or a good direction. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, Thank you.